I have a riddle for you this morning before we get started. I want to get the mind thinking loosened up here a little bit. You're the bus driver. Now you have to pay attention to the details in this riddle. If you know this one, don't give away the answer. But it's very detail specific. So the bus drives 15 miles north, makes a U-turn, and then the driver drives 15 miles south. Everybody with me so far? 15 north, U-turn 15 south. Then the driver makes a 90 degree turn west and drives 23 miles. And then the bus driver decides to make another 90 degree east and drives 24 miles. Now the question is, how old is the bus driver? Now if that seems impossible to answer, if you've never heard this riddle before, it's because you missed the very first detail that I told you. And that is that you are the bus driver. So the answer would be different for everybody in this room, depending upon your age. But you see how the details are important, right? Have you ever heard the phrase, the devil is in the details? Well, this morning I can tell you that the devil is truly in the details of Revelation chapter 13. And I apologize ahead of time. This is a very detail-oriented message. This is one that you've got to keep your head on straight. The symbols, as they're interpreted, are actually very important. We're going to dive deeper this morning into Revelation 13 than you probably ever have going through a prophecy seminar. But I pray that you can stick with me. I know there's a blessing in it. And uh, just try to keep your mind awake and thinking about the stuff that we're talking about this morning because it is relevant, very relevant, to the time that we live in. Just a quick review because we need Revelation 12 in order to understand Revelation 13. We saw that as we studied Revelation 12 together that there were three main scenes, three battlefields that the enemy tried to win against God. The first, in Revelation 12, was the birth of the child, where the enemy tried to destroy the Messiah using Rome there uh, in Revelation chapter 12. But, But God was victorious, amen? And we read that her child was caught up to God in His throne, so He lost that battle. The second scene that we saw was the expulsion of Satan from heaven. That battle that began there, that great controversy that began in heaven, eventually met its climax at the cross. And it was at the cross that those other unfallen beings in those heavenly courts forever banned Satan from ever coming into those courts again. Forever banished. So again, he loses a second time. This made him very angry, by the way. You remember we read in Revelation 12.12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Why Why would they rejoice? Because Satan would no longer have their sympathies in any way. But then it says, woe or warning to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great what? Wrath. He's very angry at this point. Has lost twice. And he's come down because he knows he has a short time. We said that's very interesting that the warning is to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea because in Revelation 13, where do the two beasts, the two great deceptions come from? The earth and the sea. That's right. And then that third scene we found in Revelation 12 was the dragon's persecution of the woman. And what is a woman in Bible prophecy? It's a church. And so coming down with great wrath, he pours that wrath out on God's people trying to destroy the remnant, the seed of that church. That battle was actually in three phases. It started there in pagan Rome as he immediately tried to destroy God's followers there, and we read historically about the Colosseums and the terrible things that were done against the Christians during that time. But for every martyr, the blood of the martyr became the seed for the next believer, and as hard as he tried to crush out that early church, he could not do it. And so eventually, he decides instead of warring against the church from the outside, what would he do? He would come into the church and battle from within. One of the worst enemies that we could have is one from within. And so when pagan Rome became papal Rome, the church adopted doctrines, traditions of men, doctrines of demons, we could say, 
distorting the character of God. And for 1,260 years, what we often refer to as a dark time in this earth's history, the dark ages, if you will, the enemy worked from within through Catholicism, warring against God's people, destroying millions of God's people during that time. And then we read about that third phase against God's people. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went, and we said in the Greek that he went is a new front. It's a new battleground. He went to make more war with the rest, the remnant of her offspring, and then there were some characteristics of what that remnant would look like. They would keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we said that these people would be commandment, not preachers, but commandment keepers. And that the testimony of Jesus Christ, we looked biblically, was none other than the gift of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy would be among their midst. And so looking briefly ahead at what we will study in the future, we saw in Revelation 12 three phases of Rome. Pagan Rome against God's people. Papal Rome for 1,260 days or years and prophetically against God's people. And then there is this threefold union this new front in Revelation 12, 17, where Satan will combine with the United States and with Protestantism to form this new threefold union, this battleground against God's final people that are alive on the face of the earth. We see the same thing as we'll branch into Revelation 13. We see the dragon employing that sea beast, which is the papacy, and then eventually that threefold union emerges here in the land beast that we will study next time. And what's really exciting, I can't wait to get to Revelation chapter 14, because here is God's answer to these deceptions in Revelation 12 and 13. It's the three angels' messages that must go to the whole world. God answers the deceptions in Revelation chapter 14. I'm very excited to get to that. Well, with that being said, let's jump into Revelation 13 and verse 1. The text begins, Then I... And this is a, a terrible translation, by the way. It should be he. In the original Greek, it's referencing still from, from Revelation 12, the dragon. So the dragon is standing on the edge of the sea about to see the deceptions come forth. And John is witnessing this. Then he stood on the sand of the sea, the dragon stood there, and I, John, saw a beast rising up out of the what? Out of the sea. Now what is a beast in Bible prophecy? It's a nation, right? And John sees this nation rising up out of the sea. Now, what is a sea in symbolic language in Revelation? Well, in Revelation chapter 17, we see that same beast. This time a woman is riding that beast. But notice what John says. Then he said to me, the waters, isn't that what we're trying to figure out? What is that sea? What are the waters? The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are what? Peoples multitudes, nations, and tongues. A very populated area, we could say. Let's go back to our text, Revelation 13, 1. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. And the description is very interesting. Having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. He goes on describing this beast. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now one could hardly look at this composite beast. This is not a real creature, obviously. It's got ten horns, seven heads. It's like a leopard, feet like a bear, mouth of a lion. You can't ignore the connection between what we're reading about here in Revelation 13 and what we know about the prophecies of Daniel. Now, going back to the book of Daniel, chapter 7, we see all the composite pieces of that beast individualized. Now, again, I apologize if this is the first time that you're seeing a presentation like this. I would invite you to go and look for the presentation we did called Revealing the Antichrist, where we will show you Daniel chapter 7 piece by piece and study it out historically, and you'll see these, these beautiful prophecies unfold. Today, I don't have time to go through this in that kind of fashion. So we're just going to do a Cliff Notes version of Daniel chapter 7. So very fast, I apologize. But hopefully for the most of, of you who are watching this, you're up to speed on Daniel chapter 7. 
So in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a vision. He spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great what? The great sea. There's that sea again. Multitudes, nations, kingdoms. There's great tumult in, in this sea at this time. And what does he say? And four beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Then he describes them. The first was like a lion. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. And then I looked, and there was another like a leopard. And behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. So Daniel is looking into the future, seeing these kingdoms rise up. Daniel sees a lion, a bear, a leopard, and then a dreadful beast. You may have noticed that John lists those beasts in the opposite order. John sees a beast, a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Daniel is looking into the future, and what is John doing? John is looking into the past fulfillment. Now you'll notice, if you study out Daniel 7, 4 through 7, it gives you the same number of heads. Babylon, one head. Medo-Persia, one head. How many heads did Greece have? Four. And then Rome makes seven. So, so far, just like that beast we're looking at in Revelation 13, we have seven heads. All right? It says about that dreadful beast that it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had how many horns? Ten horns. There are the horns from Revelation chapter 13. Now, it says the ten horns out of this kingdom are what? Ten kings that shall arise. Now, what does a king normally wear? A crown. So ten kings, ten horns with ten crowns. That's the exact description we have in Revelation chapter 13. Now, if you've ever studied Daniel before, you know that Daniel practices something we call repeat and enlarge, repeat and expand. The same time periods, the same prophecies are given over and over and over with different symbolisms, but it covers the same time period, just gives us greater detail each time. So you remember the statue in Daniel chapter 2, head of gold, chest of silver, etc. The same kingdoms are represented here in Daniel chapter 7. You've got Babylon, followed by the bear, Medo-Persia, raised up on one side, that Medo-Persian union, just like the two arms of that chest of silver. You've got Greece represented here, a very fast-moving, world-dominating power, four wings. I mean, a leopard is a very fast animal, and then the four wings representing the swiftness that it would rule the then-known world. And of course, Rome, just like the legs of iron, Rome has these teeth of iron devouring all that's before it. Now, out of that fourth kingdom, that fourth beast that Daniel said was dreadful, exceedingly terrible, it says that ten horns would rise, just like the statue had ten toes. So the statue, the division of Rome, not another kingdom came upon Rome, did it? It divided from within into ten. In the same way, this beast, instead of being devoured by another beast, ten horns come out of it. Ten divisions, we know the ten divisions of Europe. The Germans, the Swiss, the French, the Italians, the English, Portuguese, Spanish, and then, of course, those last three, the Hurrieli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, are extinct. Now, why are they extinct? Because in Daniel 7, we're told that among the ten, another little horn comes up, doesn't it? And what happens when it comes up? It plucks up three of those other horns in the process of coming up. Daniel 7, 8, and verse 20 says, it had eyes like the eyes of a man and had a mouth speaking great things. Now, if we would have time, we would go down through Daniel 7 and we would gather all the identifying marks of just the little horn. Who is this little horn? Who was it that uprooted those three uh, kingdoms in the process of coming to power? I'm just going to give you the Cliff Notes version. Number one, it would come up among the other ten. Number two, it had to be after 476. Why? because those ten did not exist until 476. So in order for three to be uprooted, they have to first be there. All right. Number three, it's a little horn or a little kingdom. Number four, it uproots three in the process of coming to power. Number five, Daniel says it has a man at its head. Number six, it's diverse or different than the other kingdoms. Number seven, it speaks great words and blasphemy. 
And we define blasphemy from the Bible, right? Two ways that the Bible defines blasphemy. Number one, if you claim to have the power to forgive sins, that would be blasphemy. And number two, if you would claim to be God, that would be blasphemy. So number seven, it speaks great words and blasphemy. Number eight, it wears out and wars against God's people. Number nine, it thinks to change God's times and laws. And number 10, it rules for a very specific time period. For a time, times, and half a time, we found biblically that that was 1,260 years prophetically. Now, when you put all that together, there's only one power that would fit this model, this uh, list of identifying marks that could, that could possibly meet all 10 at the same time. And of course, we found that that was papal Rome. You could call it the Vatican City. You could call it the Roman Catholic Church. It doesn't matter what title you use. That is the system that meets these 10 identifying marks. Now, I always throw this caveat in here. There are many sincere people in every persuasion. Amen? So God is not condemning individuals. There are many God-fearing, God-loving people within the Catholic Church. What is being condemned by the Bible is the system. God is calling us out of the deceptions of this system. So we're not condemning individuals. We're merely bringing out what God is warning us about this system. Does the Catholic Church meet those ten identifying marks? Yes, it came up among those ten divisions. It was after 476. Its, its official start date is actually 538. It's a little kingdom. It uprooted three in the process of coming to power, which we'll look at in a little bit. Does, does the Catholic Church have a man at its head? Yes, it has always had a man at its head. Is it diverse? How was it different from those other kingdoms? Well, it was a combination of church and state together, ruling differently. Did it speak great words of blasphemy? Yeah. Did it claim to be able to forgive sins? Did it claim to be God? Yes, both of those were met. Did it wear out in war against God's people during that dark time? Yeah, an estimated 40 to 60 million people lost their lives during that period. Did it think to change God's times and laws? We saw how the second commandment was taken out of the ten. We saw how the fourth commandment, which is about God's holy day, was attempted to be changed by the papacy from Saturday to Sunday. And the fourth commandment, by the way, is both a time and a law. And number ten, did it rule for 1,260 years? 538 to 1798, exactly 1,260 years. So why is God warning us about this system? Why is it so prominent in the Bible? Whole chapters dedicated to the warning about this system. Because these false doctrines, this compromise, this tradition that came into the church has come not only into the Catholic Church, but even the Protestant world is affected by this belief system. Most people will sit and watch a presentation like this and they'll say, well, I'm not Catholic. This doesn't affect me. Wrong. Every one of these doctrines, if I had time, I could show you, has crept in in some fashion to the Protestant world. Many are unaware of the deceptions that are right under their nose. And we could culminate that all at the end here under one title, Sunday Worship. Amen? Not by a dictate of Scripture, but rather by the traditions of men. This has crept into the uh, Christian world. What is the perspective then? as we're looking quickly at Daniel, what is the perspective that Daniel has? Daniel lived in the early 1600s. So here is Daniel. We put him on the map here. And he sees the lion come up. Well, he exists during the time of Babylon, doesn't he? So he is during the time of the lion. He sees the bear rising in the future. Medo-Persia. He sees Greece coming up in the future. 331 B.C. He sees beyond that into Rome that would rise, that dreadful, terrible beast. And he sees beyond that, God is showing him the events that would unfold, that that kingdom would crumble from within and that ten horns would come up. He sees beyond that and sees that a little horn would come up among the ten, uprooting three. He sees that that beast would continue for 1,200 years. And 60 years. That takes us from 538 
unto the year 1798, when the beast receives the deadly wound. At this point, what's very interesting about Daniel 7 is that he sees a judgment scene unfold. So between 1798 and the second coming, there would have to be an investigative judgment. Beyond that, if you look there at the text on the screen, it says, I, Daniel, was watching and the same horn. Wait a second. The same horn? The same horn, Daniel, that was warring against God's people back here? You're seeing it again. And he says, yes, I'm seeing that same horn is making war against the saints. That means that the deadly wound would have to be what? Healed and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was given to. Another translation error here. King James says was given to. That is the the best translation of this verse, was given to. Some of the more modern translations say was made in favor of. Not correct. The translation is that judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Now let me ask you a question. When is judgment given to the saints? And when do the saints possess the kingdom? At what event? The second coming. Daniel sees that same little horn making war against God's people up until what time? Up until the second coming. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 2, Paul says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Will we be given the judgment? Yeah. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, John says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them, to God's people. Let's look now at Revelation 13 verse 1 as we begin to dive into Revelation 13. Now with that underlying skeleton of understanding of Daniel chapter 7. Revelation 13 1, John says that he sees a beast rising out of the sea having seven heads ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. What is John's perspective in all this? Does John live during the time of Babylon? No. Babylon's zenith is over. What about the time of the Medo-Persian Empire? No. Medo-Persia is gone. What about Greece? Does John live during the days of Greece? No. Those zeniths are all over. Does John live during the time of Rome? Yes. Yes, John lives during the time of Rome. If we were to put John's little icon in there, it would be right about there. Now what John sees is a beast rising up out of the sea. In other words, he's seeing it happen right before his eyes. Having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns, how many crowns? Ten. Well, what kingdom would be next on the scene that John would see rising up out of the sea? Well, he already lives during the time of Rome. So the next kingdom must be the division of Rome. Would that make sense biblically, prophetically? Yeah, because how is it described? It's described with seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns on his horns. If John was seeing the papacy at this point in the prophecy, how many horns would it have? Well, if the papacy uprooted three, ten minus three is seven, plus the little horn would be eight. But no, as he describes it in Revelation 13, 1, it has seven heads, ten horns, ten crowns on the horns. So John, as he's seeing in vision, he sees this beast coming up. We're watching in sequential order the rise of the papacy in Revelation 13 and verse 1. What comes first? Divided Rome comes first. Then, out of divided Rome comes the papacy. Now it says here in verse 1, I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Why does John say that? Well, it's a composite beast. All the the pagan practices that Rome had were then developed into Medo-Persia. And all the pagan practices that Medo-Persia had, all the false gods that they worshipped, when Medo-Persia was defeated by Greece, just would have been assimilated into their culture. And so each one of these kingdoms was very blasphemous before God. Each one of their cultures assimilated into the next. And so when John sees this 
this uh, beast that's the culmination of all these, what does he see? He sees a vast array of paganism that's all mashed into one beast, and every one of these heads is blasphemous in nature. You'll notice in the text, it says, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. How was it like a leopard, John? Well, the leopard was aggressive. Was Rome aggressive? Yeah. It was like a bear, John says. Now, how was, how was Rome like a bear? Were there qualities of Rome that were two kingdoms in one? Yes, very much so. He says that it was like a lion. When Rome spoke, was it like the mouth of a lion? How did, how did Babylon speak in the Old Testament there in Daniel chapter 7? And even before that. You know, a nation speaks through its laws. Did Babylon make laws that were contrary to God's laws? Yeah. Was there a statue that Nebuchadnezzar commanded them to worship? Yeah. And so did Rome speak like Babylon? Did they make laws that were contrary to God's laws? Yeah. Absolutely. Now the text says that the dragon... We're looking into the future now. John sees divided Rome, and next he sees the dragon giving this, this beast his power, his throne, and great authority. Now, who's the dragon? Who's the dragon? It's Satan. We know that it's Satan, but when we studied Revelation chapter 12, didn't we say, instead of saying Satan, John very perceptively calls Satan the dragon when he's talking about what power? Doesn't a beast represent a nation? What power is he talking about? Rome. That's right. The dragon worked. Satan was working through the dragon, and the dragon represents Rome. So the beast that gives this other beast its power, seat, and authority is Rome. Rome gives the beast its seat, its power, and great authority. Would that be next on the phase that John is looking into the future? Yes, he sees divided, divided Rome come up in the future. He sees the seven heads, ten horns, ten crowns. Then he sees Rome giving the power, the seat, and great authority to the beast. Now, in order for that to happen, three kingdoms would have to be plucked up. Isn't that right? We saw that in Daniel chapter 7. We read historically that the Hurrieli, one of those three horns, met their fate with the Catholic Emperor Zeno in 493. Then another emperor, Justinian, exterminated the Vandals in 543 and then broke the power of the Ostrogoths in 538 AD. Thus, the three horns of Daniel's prophecy were plucked up by the roots, making the rise of the church in Rome a reality. It was at this time that Justinian made a decree establishing the Bishop of Rome as the political and religious leader of Western Rome. Justinian, an Eastern Roman Empire, gives to the papacy its power, its throne, and great authority. Is everybody with me so far? All right. So when we read Revelation 13, 2, interpreting the symbols, the dragon, Rome, gave him, the papacy, his power, his throne, and great authority. Now, continuing on now in verse 3, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. Now this is what stuck in my mind for so long as I was studying for this message. Does it say which one of the heads? No. It's very ambiguous. It says one of the heads. Now how many heads does this beast have? How many heads? It has seven heads. How could we possibly know which one of the heads had been mortally wounded? Well, again, if we look historically, I like to put things out in a timeline sequence. It makes more sense to me. Was Babylon a relevant head at this point in the beast? Did it exist? No, not in John's time. It was long gone. Medo-Persia, Greece, all long gone. Rome was the only head that was significant at this point. Why would I say that? Well, because Rome didn't fall. Rome developed into ten. And then out of the ten came papal Rome. So which one of the heads out of the seven would make a significant difference if it was mortally wounded? It would have to be Rome, wouldn't it? 
Which of the seven heads is supporting papal Rome? This one is. This is the one that's supporting papal Rome. It's the one that gave him his power, seat, and great authority. Does everybody see that? So Rome, in a sense, you could say is a combination at this point in history of the seven and the one. The seven divisions and the one in the papacy. It's a com combination of those divided horns. So in order for this head to receive a deadly wound, that means that the papacy would lose its seat, power, and authority. Does everybody see that? In other words, how did the papacy do its bidding during that dark time? Did the papacy have an army of its own? Did the Catholic Church have this grand army that they sent out to do all their bidding? Who did they use? One of the other seven, didn't they? They used the armies of France. They used the armies of England. They, they used all these other powers in order to do their bidding. So for one of these heads to receive a deadly wound would mean that this power would lose its seat and its authority in the process of that happening. Austin Cook, in his book, Understanding Revelation, made this point. He said, it's important to recognize that it was the head of the beast that received the deadly wound. It wasn't the horn. The Catholic Church didn't cease to exist in 1798. Does everybody understand that? What did happen in 1798 is that the Catholic Church lost its ability to persecute. It had no more authority. It had no more power to do so. It says it is not the Roman Catholic Church as such that was wounded or slain. The Catholic Church has continually functioned. Catholicism did not die in 1798. What did die was its ability to persecute. So we see that the beast receives a deadly wound. What is it that makes the deadly wound? The text in verse 2 does not say. But if we jump ahead in verse 14, we're given a clue. Revelation 13 and verse 14, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the what? Sword. So the head that received the deadly wound, the wound was made by a sword. What does a sword represent in Bible prophecy? Well, sometimes a sword would represent the word of God, right? Hebrews chapter 4. But we have to look... At the context, we have to look at history and see, does that fit? A better answer is when the sword actually represents the power of the state. Now, where do we find that? Romans chapter 13 and verse 4. Speaking about the power of the state, Paul says, For he, this power, is God's minister to you for good. Saying those who are rulers over you are supposed to be ministering for good. They have good laws in place. But if you do evil, if you break those laws... Be afraid, Paul says, for he, the state, does not bear the what? The sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So the power of the state is represented as the sword. It, was it the power of the state that gave the, the deadly wound to the beast? Yeah, it was Berthier through his French general. We also read in Revelation 13, verses 9 and 10, if anyone has an ear... Let him hear, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. This is God's curse upon the papacy. Did the papacy lead people into captivity? Yes. Did they go into captivity in 1798? Yes, the Pope was taken captive. Then it says, he who kills with the sword must be killed, how? With the sword. Did the papacy abuse the sword? Did they make laws that were put into place, that were executable, that were an abuse of power? Yeah. Laws that inflicted on our right to worship as we see the Bible commanding worship. And so God is saying as part of the curse, you led into captivity, you go into captivity. You kill with the sword, the power of the state, you will be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of the saints. Now in verse 3 of Revelation, I saw one of its heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was what? Healed. If the deadly wound is healed, then we know after 1798, there would have to be a resurrection of the papacy, just like we saw in Daniel, the papacy warring against God's people all the way up to the second coming. So at some point, 
After 1798, that deadly wound would have to be healed. A reestablishment would have to be made of his seat, his power, and his authority. Those three things. All right? And it would be healed to the extent, by the way, that all the world, says in the text, marveled and followed after this beast. Well, in February 11th, 1929, Italy gave again the statehood back to the papacy. This is out of their newspaper. It says the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy in affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing the wound, extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. It's a nice play on words. Healing of the wound right there in the newspaper. But the wound is not completely healed yet. Now they have their statehood again. But do they have power and authority to persecute? No. That has not been established yet. But is power and authority growing within Catholicism? Do you see a power that's rising within Catholicism? A popularity that is rising. You see presidents working with the papacy. You see the papacy even meeting with religious leaders and rulers uh, of the world today. His big uh, campaign this past year has been unity in diversity, where he has actually met with some of the more powerful leaders within Christianity, Joel Olstein, Kenneth Copeland, James Robinson, and many others, as he's looking to unify, and he, of course, wants to be the head of that unity. And in the not too near future, I think we'll see a fulfillment of Revelation 13 and verse 4, which says, So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Why? Because he has come back to life. He has his seat, his power, and his authority back. Who can fight against this power? Now that question there, who is like the beast, is an awful lot like we see in Scripture when the question is asked, who is like God, right? One of the things that we see developing here in Revelation 13 that is critical to understand is that the dragon, Satan, is setting up a false trinity. That's exactly what he's doing. Remember how I said it was a threefold union that would war against God's people in the very last days? He's setting up a false trinity. What do I mean by that? Well, in the Trinity, you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Revelation 12 and 13, you see the establishment of this false trinity take place. The dragon, Satan, is trying to take the place of God the Father. Why do I say that? Well, the dragon, we find his place is in heaven. God's dwelling place is in heaven. The dragon has a throne. The Father has a throne. This is very interesting. The dragon gives his power, throne, and authority to the beast we just studied, right? Well, that's exactly the same as the Father giving power, throne, and authority to Christ, as you see in the following text here. The dragon is worshipped. We just read that. All the world will worship him. And, of course, the Father is worthy of our worship here in Revelation 4.10. So, the dragon is trying to take the place of God the Father, one of the false trinity pieces. Then you have the sea beast, which is taking the place of Jesus Christ. Why would I say that? Let's notice some of the different attributes. The sea beast came up out of what? The water, right? That's when he began his ministry for the 1,260 days. Where does Jesus begin his ministry? By coming up out of the water. That's right. The sea beast resembles the dragon. You remember when we read about the dragon in Revelation 12? How many heads did the dragon have? It had seven heads, right? And when you get down the list, it resembles the sea beast, right? The dragon resembles the sea beast. In the same way, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The sea beast has ten horns upon his heads. The lamb in Revelation has seven. The sea beast receives power, throne, and authority from the dragon. Jesus receives power, throne, and authority from the Father. The sea beast ministered for 42 months, which is three and a half years. How long did Jesus minister upon the earth? Three and a half years. The sea beast was slain. 
Jesus was slain. The sea beast comes back to life. The deadly wound is healed. Jesus is resurrected. The sea beast received worship. All the world then worshiped the sea beast after he's resurrected, right? We just read that in Revelation 13, 4. In the same way, Jesus should receive worship after his resurrection. This would be the true, obviously, on this side. The sea beast was given universal authority over the earth after the healing of his wound. All authority, we read in Matthew 28, 18, has been given to Christ in heaven and on earth after the resurrection. Who is like the beast? The very question that's asked in Revelation 13, 4 is the very title of Christ in Revelation 12, 7. Who is like God? Remember when we studied that together. And then the last point, global target. This is... this. Fight, this great controversy, is over all nations, tribes, tongues, and peoples. This global target on the true side is for the same domain. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So let's review Revelation 13, 1-4. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw... Now notice, he says, I saw many times. He's seeing a vision. Okay, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It's the divided Rome. It's coming up right before him. It's in the future. Has seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns, ten crowns. And on his heads, a blasphemous name. Every one of those composite characteristics of that beast was blasphemous in nature against God. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. It had the attributes of Greece. It was like the feet of a bear. Had the attributes of Medo-Persia. His mouth was like the mouth of a lion. He spoke just like Babylon spoke. And then John sees the dragon, Rome, give him his power, his throne, and great authority. And then John sees one of the heads must be Rome, as this had been mortally wounded, and the deadly wound was healed. And all the world, the consequence of this, marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him. Now, the Biblical Research Institute has a very powerful uh, paragraph on this section. It says in 1 through 4 there, the first section we just studied together describes what John saw, the vision proper. The second, verses 5 through 10, which we're going to look at very quickly, describes the actions that took place. So John sees the vision, and then he tells you the actions that take place. The verb, I saw, occurs twice in the first section. It does not occur at all in the second. Both sections close with a verse that tells about the worship of the world toward the beast. This occurs in verse 4 in the first section and in verse 8 in the second. While the first section in the passage is descriptive, visual, it's a vision, in emphasis, the second section is didactic in its emphasis. This arrangement makes these two sections relate to each other as a vision and audition or vision and explanation. When this functional relationship is understood, it can be seen that the second section explains what was seen in the first. First four verses, John sees a vision. Five through eight, he explains the vision. Is everybody with me? That's that's the synopsis of what I just read. He sees the vision, then he explains the vision. So we already studied the vision. Let's look at John's explanation. He, this beast, was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Who gave him that mouth? Rome gave him that mouth. Great power, authority. He was given authority to continue for 42 months. What time period is the 42 months? 538 to 1798. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. What did the papacy do during the 1,260 years? They blasphemed the name of God. They claim to be God. Why is it mentioned His tabernacle? Where is God's tabernacle? It's in heaven. Where is the tabernacle according to the beast? You want to see a priest? Do you go to the heavenly priest? No. According to the beast, you go to a earthly priest. Right? Forgiveness of sins happens on the earthly level. So they blaspheme against God's name, His tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And here's the culminating verse in whether you're reading 1 through 4 or 5 through 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. I don't want to fall in that crowd, do you? 
whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. These deceptions that are coming upon the world are great, friends. This is so overwhelming if you really allow that to sink in. All who dwell on the earth will worship him unless, unless what? Your name, my name, is written in that Lamb's book of life. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life this morning? Are you sure? Are you confident that you are in that kind of relationship with Him? I found this out of the Bible Commentary, Volume 4. She says, Many who are without spiritual life have their names on the church records. Could be many of us here today. But they are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They may have joined to the church, but they are not united to the Lord. They may be diligent in the performance of certain set of duties and may be regarded as living men, living women. But many are among those who have a name that thou livest and art dead. I hope that you have that zeal and that desire to know him to really spend time studying His Word. I know that this is a very detailed presentation. It requires much concentration. But these are the kind of things that we need to be studying on our own. Amen? Great Controversy, page 625. Only those who have been diligent students of the Scriptures and have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. You know, next time when we meet, we're going to study the second beast that comes up in Revelation from the earth. That's where we are. You know how we looked at Daniel's timeline? Then we looked at John's timeline? Well, next time we're going to look at our timeline. And that's right where we are, friends. Right at that second beast, that threefold union that's about to take place, I believe, any day now. And these deceptions will be so great that we're told unless we have fortified our minds with the Bible, we will be deceived. Our High Calling, page 215, no renewed heart can be kept in a condition of sweetness without the daily application of the salt of the Word. Are you in the Word daily? Do you spend your precious time in the Word, or does He get your spare time? Divine grace, she says, must be received daily, or no man will stay converted. We can't depend on a conversion that happened yesterday, can we? Unless we are daily imbuing, imbibing in that word, she says we cannot stay converted. It's the story of the vine and the branches that Jesus tells in the Gospel of John, isn't it? We must stay. We must abide in the vine. Otherwise, what does he say? The branches that do not abide in him are cut off. I want to finish with a story I don't know if it's a true story, but it's a powerful story of a lighthouse attendant who was painting the lighthouse, a very high lighthouse, and he had not paid attention to the railing while he was painting the brick section of the lighthouse. And here the ocean water over years had deteriorated the railing as such that when he leaned back to take a break that the railing gave way and he's falling to his death. And in midair, he he is absolutely sure that this is the end. There is no way that you could survive a fall from this height. But yet, when he comes to his senses, he begins to feel around on the ground and realizes that he has fallen upon a lamb. A lamb that was grazing below, and he killed the lamb in the process of falling, but the lamb died in order that he would live. Brothers and sisters, there is a a great principle to this story, and that is that the Lamb of God, looking down into history, saw you, saw I, living in this time. We could have lived in any time in this Hearst history, but God chose for you to live right now. And He saw you all the way back then, and He loved you. And He said, I'll give my life, even if they, even if that person, if you were the only one, He would have done it. Amen? The Bible says in Revelation 13 and verse 8, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Let's not neglect the Lamb. Amen? Let's find Him. Let's cling to Him in these closing hours of earth's history. 
Now what I've taught this morning is not new truth, but it is present truth, something that I think the enemy would like for you to forget. And it's for this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. 